Hello, today I'm speaking with Professor Jesse Fried from Harvard Law School. Professor Fried is visiting Sergi as a Fulbright specialist. Most of your research work focuses on corporate governance. What fascinates you about it? Uh, corporate governance is uh, extremely important uh, because uh, the corporation is the vehicle by which um, the economy produces uh, most of its goods and services and how it's governed is extremely important for the investors in the corporation, for the people that work in the corporation, for management and for society as a whole. Your book Pay Without Performance was published in 2004 and a few years later the economic crisis happened. And as you know, some people put at least part of the blame for the crisis on inflated corporate pay scheme. What's your take on that? Well, you have to understand um, how corporations are owned in the United States. It's very different than in most other parts of the world, including Central Europe. We have, instead of a controlling shareholder in most corporations, widely dispersed shareholders. Um, who, because of collective action problems, don't exert enough discipline and control over the management of the corporations. And so one of the problems that arises is that the people that are actually running the corporation on a day-to-day -day basis, um, mostly the CEO, but also some of the directors, who are friends of the CEO, um, shape pay arrangements in a way that's beneficial to the management team and not beneficial to shareholders. The pay tends to be too high and it is not structured well to give executives the proper incentive to generate value over time. So in the book that I wrote with Professor Lucian Bebchuk, who's also at Harvard, we looked at pay arrangements in public companies. Um, the first thing we did is we explained why boards are not bargaining at arm's length with executives. There are a lot of economists who treat corporations as a black box and they assume that when the corporation contracts with the CEO, um, it's contracting at arm's length and what emerges out of the process is a pay arrangement that is designed to give the executive good incentives and it's for a fair amount. But if you look a little bit more carefully into what happens in these companies, the people who are making the decisions about how much to pay the executives, they're not paying with their own money. They're paying with shareholders' money. They're also often friends of the CEO who they're paying. The CEO is often doing all sorts of favors for them, like giving money to their favorite charities or entering into business deals with them. And so we don't really have arm's length bargaining in the CEO pay negotiation process. And that leads to pay arrangements that are not structured properly. Um, and what we do in the book is we look at all the different features of pay arrangements and we explain why they're not really consistent with arm's length bargaining uh, by directors that want to maximize value for shareholder, but rather they're sort of the, at least in part the result of this non-arm's length process. But how sophisticated are shareholders to make these decisions? Well, shareholders are getting more sophisticated um, for two reasons. One is that people like me um, write books and articles on executive pay and about what ex executive pay should look like to provide the right incentives. And shareholders, lawyers, compensation consultants actually read the stuff that we write. So the world is getting a little smarter over time. The other thing is that shareholders in the United States have become more concentrated over time. So about, I don't know, 30, 40 years ago, most of the shares were held by individuals. These individuals owned very small amounts. So they didn't vote, they didn't play an active role in corporate governance because they were not informed and their votes would not make any difference. Over time, we've seen an increasing percentage of the shares coming to be held by institutional investors who are more sophisticated and own bigger stakes, which means that their votes you know, on the margin are more likely to make a difference. But 
Don't many shareholders also have short-term interests? One of the problems with trying to sort of kick the responsibility back to shareholders once you, th once you decide that directors are not doing a good job is that some of the shareholders may not have the best interests of the corporation and its long-term shareholders. Um, and so they may be pushing for things that are not um, going to generate long-term shareholder value. But the good thing about short-term shareholders is that they're very focused on making sure that managers are not taking too much for themselves and that managers are not doing various types of things that are likely to uh, reduce value over time, like build empires and things like that. Is there a conflict between economic theory, such as rationality assumption and uh, Pareto efficiency, and basic human rights and distributive justice? So I write in the area of corporate governance where what is generally at stake is money. Um, and the, the central question is how can we organize corporate governance arrangements to generate the maximum amount of value? Um, and so it's an area where I feel comfortable applying economic theory and economic tools and ignoring uh, other philosophical considerations. If I were writing about um, immigration or human rights or constitutional law, um, I probably would not rely exclusively on economic tools. I would um, have to uh, find other toolkits uh, to draw from. But in the area where I'm writing, um, where basically what's at stake is how much wealth can be created, I think economic theory is not only useful, but it's indispensable. And I think one of the problems that lawyers have had in the United States and elsewhere is not understanding um, many of the lessons that economics has taught us.